Thank you very much for taking the time today to view our video. Before we begin, we'd like to take a moment to introduce ourselves. There are many aspects to 9.connect, but it boils down to the fact that we're a PCB-centric organization. We believe and focus on the PCB due to the fact that it is truly the center point of all electronic design. That's where our expertise lies. We provide services not only in the PCB layout, but in design consulting as well. And during the technical portion of this webinar, you will see this expertise in motion. We are now the exclusive North American instructors for Altium Designer. We host 100 trainings throughout the year across North America, and we are excited to bring these trainings closer to you. In addition to our services, we are also a value-added reseller for a number of PCB-related software companies. And just to note, each company has been presented in past webinars. So if you're interested in them, please contact us or check out our website. And by the way, we provide one-on-one -on -one coaching for these tools as well. For more information on our services and past webinars, please contact us. Our information is listed in the description below. Thank you for giving us a moment of your time, and please enjoy the presentation. So, we've been working at this for years. When I worked at Altium as an, uh, as an AE taking support calls, customers asked us this question all the time, can I use the library for cable? And the answer was, well, yeah, but we don't know how. And it wasn't for a lack of trying. Myself and several others tried to do it. We'd spend hours on it, and we just couldn't get it to work. And then finally, two years ago, I was assisting a company here in Carlsbad, California, and asking them, they, they were asking me, hey, we do cable drawings all the time in PCAD. We're going to continue to do them in Altium. Help us out over here. We really need a library. So I was tasked with this effort to try to make this work for them. And I uh, sweated through it, and I finally dawned on me why we were having problems getting the cable library to work. And it's principle number one. And that is we have to separate the physical aspects of the cable from the electrical. And I can't tell you how important this is. And believe it or not, it's so obvious that it's not obvious. And let me give you an example of that. When we do PCB design, for example, when we're in the schematic editor, what are we doing? We're doing the logical design. And we push everything over to the PCB design in order to do the physical. Okay, so we actually use two editors in Altium Designer to complete a PCB design. What we were trying to do with the cable over here, we were trying to take a single editor and add both the physical and the electrical in one area all together. And that's just not going to work. It's not possible. And where this thing just kind of stirred, stirred me in the eyes and just said, here's the answer to it, is what the customer provided me. So this is a drawing that they did in PCAD when we imported it into Altium. They said, we want, this is what we do. And when I looked at it, it dawned on me finally that said, you know what? Here's the physical and here's the electrical. They separated those out. So why are we trying to make everything work within one drawing over here. We need to show both aspects. So that's why it's really important that we separate the physical aspect from the electrical aspect. And in fact, if you look at the E3 tool, which uh, Jeff's going to show here in a couple of minutes, that concept runs across the entire platform of that tool. Separate the physical from the electrical. Okay. And by the way, these slides, as Jason mentioned, are available to you as well. There's a few I'm just going to skip over. This is just the definition of the physical, the electrical, as I see it in my eyes. The net list can be derived from these components, from the electrical aspect of it. You'll see that here in a few moments. Now, the physical, uh, pardon me, the second principle is that all cabling components must be in the library. Okay, it goes back to everything I said two months ago with the Tor libraries and the introduction to libraries. You've got to have these components in the library. Why is that? Well, if we go back to this original design that we have here, and you look at this, these are all three primitives. There's nothing I can do to get this into the bill of material. Because in order for me to get to the bill of material, it has to be a component. In order for it to be a component, it has to start in the library. So that's where this kind of runs dry and at an end. There's no intelligent data behind these wonderful drawings. So as a result, we've got to have the library. But there's an important corollary to this, if that's the correct word for it. Each component that is purchased has to be its own component. And I give the example of a DB9 connector because it never ceases to amaze me how many different varieties there are of a DB9 connector. And in theory, you can buy a separate housing, a separate header, separate pins, and separate jack screws for a DB9 connector. And if you do that, each one of these has to be represented in the library. So be very careful about what you're purchasing because there are certain things that are included and certain things that aren't included. So here's an example of one that has the shroud and the jack screws in it. So that would just be one line item. But you would have to buy the pins possibly separately, the header separately, 
So make sure that those things are being added into your library as separate line items, because those get pushed to the schematic, and in turn they get pushed into the bill of materials. And you need to have a line item for each thing that you're going to purchase. So that's the second most important principle here. The third most important principle that we have here is the callout. Now in PCB work, we don't worry about callouts because we really don't work from the schematic. Uh, in fact, if we're ever going to do anything by hand, we most of the time are going to work on, work on it through the PCB side of point of view. Uh, but when we're doing cabling, it's not uncommon to take something like this, and here's the alchemized version of this, by the way, take something like this, print it off, hand it off to the operator and say, here's the bill of material, here's your bucket of parts, build it. Okay? We don't normally do that with PCBs, so but in cabling we certainly do that. So that's why it's important that the callout is a part of the library. Because when you have this all together, and you did put this into the library appropriately, when we go to reports, bill of material, this is what you're going to get from this. I'll just give it a minute over here, but you're going to see all the callouts that are coming up over here. And these callouts basically follow those numbers that you see here in each one of the bubbles. So an operator can take this list, can take this schematic, go out there and produce the part for you. And, and for the most part, unless you're doing millions of these things, most of these times these are in the dozens and they're going to be hand done. So that's why it's really important to do this. And of course, also the manufacturer information is in here as well. If I want the manufacturer's name, manufacturer's part number, we can add it. So most of the work is going to be done for you over here. The only caveat that you got is that sometimes with the quantities, you may have to change things. Because when we're talking about a cable, well, I may have listed it seven times, but we're not going to buy seven cables. What we're going to do is we're going to buy a spool of it, or we're going to want to put something in feet, or it may say something like as required. So there may be some post work that you're going to have to do on the quantities here, but the rest of it's all ready to go, which is a lot better than typing this out by yourself in Excel. Okay. Let's take a look at the library for a moment, just so that you can see how all this stuff kind of plays together. Because you may say in your mind, principle number one is I've got to separate the physical from the electrical. And now you're saying I've got to have one part in the library to be representing the bill of materials. Well, how are you doing that? So let's take a look at the library here and look at one particular component. So we've got a plug over here. And you'll notice that we are using submodules. And you want to be very familiar with submodules when you're working in cable libraries. And you want to make sure also that when you're doing these things that you keep to a pattern so it's very easy for you and your colleagues to look this up when you go into the library's panel. The way we did this initially and kind of kept along with it was that here is part A, which is the side view. Here's part B, which is the electrical view. Here's part C, because they wanted to have the face view of it. And then part D was our call out. Now, part E was thrown in there, too, as basically a way to add a line item for a bill of materials onto the schematic itself. Some people like it. This company ultimately abandoned that idea because of the changes. Every time they made a change to the bill of material, that represented a change to the cable. And when you had something in production, any rev changes went through a lot of bureaucracy. So they said no more bill of materials within their cable design. But this is the concept that we added in there so that they could stack this one after another as they brought them into the uh, library. So that's why you see that in here. So those are the parts that we have. And you can see that the call out is always a part of every single one of these libraries. And as I mentioned, or we mentioned before, and I'll mention again, the library is something that we also provide as a part of the file package if you're interested in looking at it. Okay. Let me bring this uh, PowerPoint pr presentation back up over here. So let's move on to the next principle. So principle number four is very, very important. Primitives of the component are locked upon placement. I can't tell you how many times this caused a lot of problems for us. So just to give you a little history, you may have seen some articles by a fellow by the name of Sainer Solanke over at Altium, several blogs that he did on cable components. Well, back in 2012, both Sainer and I worked together on this concept. I was responsible for the methodology, methodology of it. Sainer was responsible as the lead librarian to implement it. And as we went along, we found things that worked great for one project but didn't work very well for another project. But this particular principle always tripped us up. What do we mean by that? Well, in the library, if we go to part A over here, I can move things around in my heart's content. All right? These are just nothing but dumb primitives. However, once this gets placed out onto the schematic, it's locked. I can't make a change to it. So here's an example of a library component. I'll page it up here so you can see it. All right, I can't make changes to this. If that 28 is in the wrong location, I've got to go back to my library and make the change and push over the change. I can't change this. I can double click into it, but I'm not going to be able to unlock anything. I can't explode the primitive as we can do in the PCB. All right. Now, oops, let me cancel this. That's why it's chiming at me here. 
there's one exception to that, and that is the connector here. So let me bring up this connector here and unlock the pin. And by the way, you can do this, you can do this on pins anytime you want, both in the cable and the schematic. And the reason why you might want to unlock those pins is so that you can move the pins around. And actually, let me just grab, push this here so you can just see I can move these around. And you can do this on the PCB side as well. So if you have a really long IC and you don't want to have all these weird wires coming off of it, let me page down here so you can see this. Or here's a better example on the cable. But the same thing applies to the PCB as well. One more click. Get that in the center so you guys can see it. If I want these lines to go straight across and not have to have all these right angle bends, I can unlock the pins and move the pins around accordingly so that these lines all go across nice and straight. So yeah, we definitely use this in the cable design, but you can also use this in the PCB as well. So it's just a matter of unlocking it here, right? Unlock the pins. I unlocked this one earlier when I was going through some test runs. But they are locked by default. But I can't make changes to anything else. I can delete a pin. I can change its properties. I cannot add a pin. Uh, and in terms of this triangle, if I wanted to stretch it out, I can't. It will not allow me to stretch it out. It will allow me to move it, but I cannot stretch it. I can't change its color. I can't change the border colors. Any of those type of things I am not going to be able to make modifications to. So be wise about how you do these things in the library, because once they're there, that's it. Just another example, we wanted to have a note area so that we could each drop a note every time we had something uh, to put down the library. We ultimately had to abandon the idea because the text even gets locked down. We couldn't even modify the text. So each one of these now has to be drawn up in the, the schematic editor itself. So those are the kind of limitations you have to uh, be aware of. So those are the four major principles that we have to be aware of. Now you may be looking at this and saying, wow, those drawings are pretty slick. What do they do to get those together? And there's a process that you can use to get this down to about 10, 20 minutes. The company that I was working with literally drew these things by hand. This is an example of what they used to do. They would draw these things out. They'd get a pair of calipers, maybe a sample. They would get the data sheets. They would draw these out one to one because they did not want their operators to have any confusion whatsoever of what they were supposed to put together. So they'd draw these out in PCAT and then if they needed to use them, they would open up these sheets that were just loaded with these examples. They would sweep over this, do a control C and put it into their design. So of course you had to know where things were, otherwise you had no way of indexing it which is what the, that's the major benefit of using the library. But they were drawing these things uh, literally two, three days to draw these things if someone was just sitting down there and taking the measurements and drawing them out. So the question is, what can we do? Well, the process that we came up with to really shorten that whole effort, because we had to do 55 cables, and all of these cables are pretty much using brand new components. They were using new terminator blocks from a company called Phoenix. So as a result, we had to completely change everything out. So with 55 cables and well over 100 connectors, we weren't going to sit there with a pair of calipers to do this. What we did was we said, all right, look, these companies, any of them that are worth their, you know, worth their salt, are going to give you a set file because the MEs want that. So we took the set file, which is a one-to-one -one rendition in, in 3D. We used SolidWorks, and I assume other capsules can do this, and we actually converted it to 2D images, the isotropic, uh, the front, the side views, the back views. We got those things. Uh, as a result of this rendering process. And then we were able to save that out as a DXF DWG file. And then we were able to import that into Altium. And then from there, let me just push this over here. And we can't import it into the library, unfortunately. They don't have the ability to do that. But if you can imagine for a moment, let me go back to this one, that this got imported here. And you'd have a bunch of free primitives once you've imported the DXF DWG into the schematic sheet. You could do a control C on this, go over to your library, do a control V. Now you've got your image. And now you've got your library part. And again, if you're pretty fast with it, I think it took us more time sometimes just to find the part than to go through that process that I just mentioned to you. So 10, 20 minutes can render you a pretty quick and nice, nice and easy part. And again, most of these connector companies are going to provide that to you. The last thing I'm going to mention before I turn the floor over to my colleague, uh, Jeff, is how long does it take to do something of this nature? In fact, this one over here. Let's go to this one here. That's the one I want. And let's do a view at VS if you fit. Okay. If you're proficient with it and as your library is growing, I've talked to people who are putting these cables together. It really took about one to two days, and that's not really uncommon for any type of cable drawing. And the fact that you'd be able to use a library that's going to quickly show you these things in the library panel, the fact that this is going to kind of draw very similar to what you're doing already in the PCB, it should have pretty much the same look and feel uh, as if you were doing a PCB design. 
The last thing I'll show you before I turn it over, actually there's two more things I'll show you very quickly just for your information. Um, to place a part into, into here because you're probably saying, well, how do you place it because there seems to be a lot of uh, aspects of it. So let me place this plug here just to show. If I place the part like this, okay, I got my part over here, the two things that you really want to be concerned with is the call-out number and the designator. So in this case, let's say that this one is a, a P10, and I do want to show the designator for this. All right, but I'm also need to uh, talk about the call-out. Now, I'm not going to show the call-out for the first item, but I do want to have that call-out information in there. And I recommend that you deal with the call-out up front. Don't wait for the end because it gets really difficult, and Alpium right now doesn't have a script or way of just filling in the blanks. As far as I don't know, I haven't really put my thought to that. But uh, unlike document sheets, for example, you know, the call-out number is something you want to make sure you control. So I'll put 20 in there for now just so I can see it. So that's the part A. Okay, and then once part B comes in, here's my electrical. I'll leave it the way it is right now. If I hit the tab key, you'll see that this is still visible, and my call is still there, and that's good because I don't want that to propagate. And then the last one, well, pardon me, this one here, same thing. This time I don't necessarily need the designator, so I'll turn it off. But again, you see the call out here. I'll press OK, drop that one down. And then here's my call out, which again is very important. So I'm going to turn on the, that one, and then you'll see that it will say the call out is 20. And then I'm going to right click to end it because I don't need the bill of material line. From there, it's really just a matter of dragging these things over to the appropriate location where you're going to you know, either do your physical or your electrical. Make sure I grab that there correctly. Okay? And that's why you want to make sure that those are all set up at once because once you separate them off, it gets a lot harder to recognize and realize where they are. As for the connectivity down here below, this is the last thing I'll mention and talk about, this is just nothing more than lines and busy A curves. Okay? There's no there's no logical or electrical connectivity between the two. It's strictly a drawing for the purposes of visual representation. The last thing is the placement. I'll place a busy air curve on here because it's so funny. I just remember doing training class like, why did they ever put this thing in here? And now I use it all the time. So um, I answered my own question uh, very quickly years after. The busy air curve, just to let you know, very useful, and I'm going to give you two tips on doing it. First and foremost, you have to have four points when you do a busy air curve. Okay, Alpine's looking for four of them. So my recommendation is your first point should be where you want to start it. So I'm going to start it here. So here's my second point. Here's my third point. And then let's say I'm going up here. That will be my fourth point. And Alpine's going to say, okay, I got my four points. I'm done. And I'm going to right click to end it. Once I click on this here, I can use the second and the third point to move things about. And that's the easiest way to do it. You can always move the first and the four points, but I've always found that if you put the first and the four down first, then it's just a matter of adjusting the second and the third. 